All right. Um, uh, so uh, sorry about the snafu there, uh, folks. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in Histro for the last two and a half years uh, as a solution engineer. And uh, I've been in the space for more than 10 plus years, um, actually a lot more than that. Um, um, and then um, uh, some of you might have uh, seen some of the blogs coming out of Histo site. Um, uh, so I do write uh, blogs for the business user audience. And um, I'm based for the San Francisco area and a little bit about myself. I play golf as well as uh, do some biking. So, uh, so uh, that's about me. And then, um, so for today, um, uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about, uh, you know, supply chain a little bit. Uh, some of you folks may already know. I saw, I see uh, uh, some uh, executive audience as well as uh, data scientists, a mix of uh, audience here. Uh, so I'll try to sort of like uh, make these topics uh, relevant to uh, both groups. Um, so as you all know, uh, right, uh, there's going to be a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, disruptions uh, recently, COVID-19 being the biggest in the last couple of years. And then you had this uh, one incident, the Suez Canal, uh, you know, the ship getting stranded there uh, as another incident that applied uh, supply chain worldwide, right? So, and also there's a lot of consumer shift going on uh, connected to COVID-19 and outside that. And then uh, one of the other things uh, that is slowly happening is also climate change. Right, all of these actually have a huge impact on the supply chain, as you already know, right? Uh, if you're uh, in this business, uh, so just a little bit more details, right? So, uh, so disruptions can happen across, uh, and also models and process across, you know, manufacturing, warehouse management, transportation, distribution, logistics, right? All across supply chain, right? Including cash flow, right? Um, and then um, obviously there's a big uh, demand and supply shift in terms of, uh, as you probably saw the toilet paper and the hand sanitizer running out during the COVID-19 times. And obviously, uh, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, demand for more household supplies because most people are working from home, right? And then, um, you know, PPE, baking goods, alcohol, right? Uh, has gone up quite a bit. And also um, less automotive shaving products and flowers and makeup and so on, right? So basically there's a big shift in demand and sometimes this can happen suddenly and this can happen over time. Um, and uh, the, the thing is, even if things recover a little bit, right? And then things stabilizes, uh, you're gonna have, uh, we're already seeing that Corona Delta variant coming up and you know, and so many different places. So you're gonna have, uh, you know, further disruption and then recovery, right? There's gonna be a lot more happening more frequently. And obviously we also saw political changes and also there's also drastic climate changes. All of the supply, supply uh, affects supply chain. So uh, what are the transformative challenges for a company who are in, you know, uh, dealing with supply chain, whether uh, it's online, uh, you're selling things online or brick and mortar or whatever, right? So you're gonna have as a business, uh, have to have a good balance of uh, tactical forecasting and strategic initiative like short term and long term and also uh, you want to continuously you have the challenge of com continuously optimizing process for sustainable production it's not business as usual anymore you have to adapt really quickly right and your turnaround times the folks who respond and adapt quickly are probably going to survive a lot longer in the business right and even more so now in this uh, disruptive era and um, uh, apparently uh, all behind, you know, the supply chain is a lot of manufacturing going on. And uh, you're gonna have to also, that's another challenge is that going from preventive to predictive maintenance and recovering quickly, right? So all of that also affects. And uh, uh, just trying to keep up with all of that is gonna require a lot of uh, business transformation. And uh, obviously, you know where I'm gonna go with this is that you probably need to go, I'm just gonna say it is that you're gonna need artificial intelligence to keep uh, the supply chain going right and we have like all these different categories i'm just highlighting a few categories here and then uh, some subcategories like we're looking at procurement you're going to supply management demand sensing we're going to go a little bit more into this and I, we already talked about predictive maintenance all of these are right for you know ai transformation and uh, um, traditionally uh, things are run with spreadsheet with you know rules based software Right, all of this uh, can be completely disrupted, if you may, right, and then uh, be more adaptive. Uh, it's kind of where I'm going uh, with this presentation. Uh, so a little bit more on this. Um, so if you just look at warehouse management, uh, beyond uh, just like you know, um, our structured data, you're also going to be working with images, 
things like automatic uh, detection of packages that you know some retailers are already doing and then transportation too like you have computer vision you got route optimization so kind of like brand new um, you know just going with beyond structured data uh, like working on network data or image data or even like text data right you're going to see a lot of this data going into these models is, um, uh, and then uh, disrupting the traditional models that's not been successful in the last couple of years. Uh, one of the key things uh, uh, that is constantly asked for, uh, even across our customer base, is that, uh, hey, how do I reduce delivery times to a customer, right? Uh, so uh, how do you build models around that? And also inventory management how to you know make sure that uh, you don't have uh, too many things expiring and then uh, you know managing the shelf life of products um, you know that sort of thing and then obviously uh, we also talked about waste reduction and uh, the cash flow uh, is also something that constantly comes up so while running a business uh, not just directly connected to supply chain but also just like across the finance aspect of it is that how do you do treasury management, like daily, weekly, cash on hand, cash to invest, cash to borrow? Uh, uh, these are you know, common things in any business and more so in supply chain than ever, right? So you really want to be able to manage, right? And then also the excess cash you want to invest on overnight uh, you know, instruments and things like that. Um, so uh, especially during the COVID era, we found that demand sensing, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later, uh, uh, is, um, is something uh, that's very new. So what is demand sensing is that uh, when you have models that can uh, allow you to plan for a couple of weeks and things drastically change for a couple of days, like how do you adapt those models to daily changes, uh, hourly changes, right? So things don't uh, run out of, uh, you know, shelves don't run out of, thing, out of things, right? So uh, how do you manage that? Uh, so that's a sort of like a very specific uh, uh, sort of like topic uh, uh, on top of, you know, forecasting and things like that. And we'll get to that in a minute. So all of these, right, uh, you're going to have complexities. And um, the common challenges, right, with the traditional approaches is that, as I told you, like multiple variables, lots of variables change very rapidly. And you don't have a whole lot of historical data in this rapid era change. Right. Earlier, you, you can rely on a couple of years of data to predict something in the next few months or you know, plan for the next few months. Right now, there is no historical data. History keeps changing every couple of months. So what do you do? Right. And then uh, the manual methods. Right. So, uh, you know, as you folks know, there are still Excel models out there. Right. Uh, uh, based on domain knowledge and all of that. And then uh, those are not relevant anymore. Uh, those are completely disrupted, uh, especially people in finance know. Right, um, you cannot really predict like how many people you're going to hire or you know plan for a budget or you know report to a CFO saying, hey, I I I think my outlay is going to be so much and this is how much you're going to be spent. You can't be sure so much with those models, and also uh, if Excel models you thought were a little bit old, and then there's also the software rules based models based on domain expertise, which are all getting outdated, right? So you have to sort the manual methods are really not the uh, go forward approach. And so what is the cost of all of this? So when you have accurate, inaccurate models uh, to be uh, tested or back tested or whatever, uh, you're going to have an economic cost on uh, uh, when you're going off forecast, uh, right? Um, so uh, those are the kind of things that um, uh, you know uh, affects the business as you know. So why is this harder, right? So generally, there's a tech debt that we talked about, like you know, Excel spreadsheets and software, but also shortage of time because you want to do everybody wants it now and want it correctly, and also uh, you know access to talent. So even if you hire the best talent and they come with their own methods, it's going to take um, you know sometimes months uh, just to build a countrywide forecast, just one country forecast. I know it takes a couple of weeks for some companies, and then how do you trust the model? In the rapidly changing era, when things change, somebody comes up with a model. Uh, how do you know how to trust it? How do you explain it? So basically, things have shrunk quite a bit. So you really need to um, sort of uh, take care of uh, building really good models, right? And uh, and how do you do that? There is also other issues of uh, training scale. It's not about uh, just uh, doing one forecast, uh, right? Let's say you're trying to forecast demand and supply for one country, how do you do for a region? How do you do for, you know, just look at the time groups on the bottom of the slide. 
most companies really want to be able to do forecasts across hundreds of these groupings like hey for this country for this department for this store for this sku what is going to be my sales for 30 days 90 days weekly daily and if you can you give this to me in like every 30 days or can you give this to me in every couple of weeks or every week right and adjusted one as things change in the ground so these are the kind of challenges like like how do you train your models at this scale with less historical data uh, and um, uh, obviously there's a lot of demand for these forecasts there's no pun intended right uh, that uh, constantly business asks for right everybody wants estimates good estimates so those are the big challenges right in supply chain especially and then also the question of deployment like how are you going to deploy this model right um, are, are, are you going to be deploying this in uh, uh, you know in a standalone or a server or database UDF how do I fit in and uh, where do I uh, put the model? How do I monitor it? And you folks know this right better than I do. So um, you have these questions. So going back to COVID-19 data, right? So uh, uh, speaking of talent, uh, H2O, uh, you know, we have Kaggle Grandmasters who compete in this Kaggle competition. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, we've been working with, uh, you know, hospitals and uh, other uh, institutions uh, to give them forecasts on uh, how COVID-19 is spreading, right? So. Uh, we worked uh, quite a uh, so there is we have participated in competitions and global forecasting competitions where where week after week uh, uh, we were in the leaderboards of prediction because we created really good models right when COVID so we're really like tracking uh, across not just United States but across all the different co countries across counties uh, and um, uh, just going beyond machine learning you know we are building all these power growth models and things like that. So what we have done is that we have taken this COVID-19 uh, data and then incorporated it into a product, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, right? So we don't have a whole lot of time, and I'm sure we can, um, you know, if you're really interested, we can go more into details, um, you know, after you talk to us. Uh, but the, the thing that I want to tell you is that all the intelligence that was built in competing in this competition has gone into a product, especially the shared model, like epidemiological models. And the reason why this is important is because in your models, you really want to incorporate COVID-19, right? Uh, things like lockdowns, vaccination, mandatory social distancing, uh, including COVID-19 growth, right? So, and I can show you an app that our grandmasters have built and share it to the public. So you can actually build with even the Delta variants, like how it's going to grow in Santa Clara County or whatever county uh, that you're in. And you can actually see like how it's getting affected, right? So, uh, so basically we are in lock, lock and step with uh, how learning about how COVID-19 is spreading uh, across you know, various different variables. And in order for your models to be robust, it's extremely important that you uh, incorporate these predictions into your model. It's kind of where I'm going with this. So it's, it's great to predict COVID-19, so what, right? So, well, the hospitals can definitely use it to forecast you know, how many beds they need and things like that, but this can also go into your supply chain models. And uh, in addition to COVID-19, um, from a broader perspective, you do want to incorporate additional macroeconomic data. Some of this could be related to COVID-19, but let the algorithms figure out, you know, what's correlated and what not, right? Especially mobility data, right? Earlier, we see like a big wave of people moving from the cities to the rural areas. Now we see people from rural areas going back to the cities. And so all of this, um, you know, going into your model with extremely less historical data, let's like even like three or four months, is going to make it like really robust, right? So you're going to have less misclassification, more accurate forecast, more confidence in your models. Um, and then you also have this notion of short-term versus long-term forecast, right? So short-term models can be power growth models or uh, seared type models. Uh, by the way, as I told you, this is already in, the, in an AutoML product. Long-term models uh, can't be this because for the lack of historical data. So you will have to go with what scenarios, right? So you can run simulations and I can show you some apps where you do that where you can say, hey, what if this happened? What if somebody had a hypothesis? So the reason why you do hypothesis is that you don't really know all the answers, what's gonna happen one year from now, but at least you have a range of possibilities uh, by which uh, you know, your outcomes can occur and you can see like how wide the you know, variance can be and you get some pretty good idea. And as you go progress through the year, you can actually make adjustments to those models. So think about like when it comes to supply chain, you need both short-term machine learning, long-term what if scenarios. Uh, right, and then we talk about demand sensing. So, okay, you build a short-term forecast model, and what is demand sensing? Demand sensing is like you're superimposing just what happened like last week into your models, and then you're kind of like adjusting it uh, to kind of like make those incremental changes. 
and this is extremely important for uh, you know uh, retailers right um, as they um, the retailers can just stock up based on 30 days they need to actually manage what's going to go into the shelves and what the demand is going to be every other week they need to have some planning so demand sensing is a great tool and especially because you want to do demand sensing across thousands of products you can actually use automatic machine learning to automate that right you're not going to get away with rules all right so um uh, so let's take a pause here and say okay so we said a lot of things right now and um, how do we make this all come together we talked about training we talked about uh, COVID-19, we talked about, um, you know, deployment, and we talked about all of this. And uh, I want to actually introduce you a, a new uh, product from Histro called Histro AI Hybrid Cloud. Uh, pardon if I just turn on the video just a little bit, um, um, but I'll be back in a second. Um, yeah, so what is Histro AI Cloud? The Histro AI Cloud basically uh, is about making the models, operating the models, which is like deploying, and then Innovate. So what's innovate? Innovate is like, okay, you made a model with automatic machine learning. You operate it because you deploy it. And then when you say innovate, it's actually taking this model and making it business friendly and creating those apps. So history AI hybrid cloud runs both on-prem and on the cloud, whether it's GCP or uh, AWS or Azure. And uh, it runs on Kubernetes. Um, so basically, uh, you can have the Kubernetes fabric going across from on-prem to, uh, to the cloud, and the data scientists can create models. Um, you know, DevOps can operate those models, and uh, you know, uh, web developers and data scientists and data engineers can innovate and make apps for the business user to run the business. And all of this scales infinitely on Kubernetes, right? So uh, with Hestro, we deliver actually strategic value with a state-of-art machine learning platform, like I told you, right? So it's going to empower our organization with agility and confidence, and then um, and then you can put AI to work, right? So we basically simplify making of models you can trust, which is extremely important. And you don't have to sacrifice accuracy because uh, you have one week to build a model or few days to build a model. And you're going to have scale. And you're going to have performance because we also run on GPUs. Our models are built on GPUs. And then transparency is extremely important, so it's not a black box, right? Uh, the key thing is all about centralizing the model operations and then accelerating the deployment of applications everywhere, right? So you can run the apps on on-prem or cloud, hybrid, it's seamless, right? So you're going to have one platform to test different ideas and then you implement them quickly, right? And all you need to do is to have for, to build the apps to learn, uh, you know, Python, right? So here is your sort of the stack, if you may. Uh, so you have the very flexible architecture. Uh, the architecture is going to do all the feature transformations, right? Um, um, and then we also have a feature store and a roadmap. Uh, so basically, uh, the data scientists are building features. Uh, the automatic machine learning is learning from the data. And then you have uh, time series, NLP, computer vision, MLI, everything you need for the supply chain, right? And then model operation is extremely important, right? So once you have a model, what do you do with it, right? So you don't like... So you put it, you can deploy it, I can show you a demo how we do it. As soon as you create a model, it goes into production right away, right? After, you know, obviously uh, back testing and all of that, which is all taken care of by the framework. And then we have the app store where, uh, you know, data scientists and web developers can socialize their uh, sort of like uh, uh, the app uh, to uh, the business and the businesses can talk to other businesses. They can share information and it's all on Kubernetes. Uh, right, uh, it's totally containerized architecture. So uh, that's Hestro AI Cloud for you. Okay, so I think um, I'm unable to show you, uh, may not be able to show you a lot of things today, but I just want to give you a sense of how this uh, make, operate, and innovate works in Hestro uh, uh, AI Hybrid Cloud. So, so let me bring up my uh, browser here. Um, I don't know if you folks have seen this. Uh, let me just uh, make sure I. All right, so um, you can actually uh, register with this and play with this yourself. Uh, and I'm sure we'll give you a link at the end. There's a trial uh, link uh, uh, available for all. Um, if you want to play with it and see how it is, this is how the UI looks like. Um, so how do you make something? Like how do you build a model, right? So you want to build, let's say, like a 30-day uh, forecast model. So we do have a, a link here where you can say my AI engines 
And what we have done is uh, we have actually integrated our driverless AI automatic machine learning platform. Uh, so let me just kick this off. Um, Um, and then, um, so, uh, it, you know, it's got automatic stopping to save you um, some dollars. Okay, let's see this one. Um, all right, so this one. Okay, so let's just wait for it to come up. It's gonna take a couple of minutes. So what we're doing here is this. Uh, so uh, from the AI virtual, every data scientist has a single sign on and then uh, integrated into your authentication framework. It runs in, behind the VPN in your infrastructure. We don't host it, you host it. We'll install it for you. And then uh, we will. Uh, you can have a bunch of apps and all these apps are very easy to create. Uh, we have an open source SDK called the Wave SDK. All you need, all now someone needs is Python and we have an R1 coming up pretty shortly. Uh, with a few lines of code on a low code environment, you can basically build a, mo uh, you know, you can use an existing model, which I'm gonna build right now. Uh, oh, there we go. So that was fast, isn't it? So we brought up the uh, uh, driverless AI uh, instance. Uh, and let's go ahead and build a time series demo. So um, I have a retail data set here. Uh, um, and uh, you can see like it's got things like store, department, date, weekly sales. This is historical data. It's got a couple of categorical data like markdowns and whether uh, it's a holiday, there's some sample weight columns. With the, you know, so this column is used with this, like a Thanksgiving, you know, you just give a little bit more weight to it. So it doesn't think it's an anomaly or something. So, and then uh, if you go to the data set rows, you can see for every store and department and for every weekly date, there's a weekly sales. And there are hundreds of stores and uh, departments in this data set, right? Uh, uh, I'm saying hundreds, let's go take a look. Maybe not hundreds, but okay, not a whole lot, but uh, still, yeah. So you have 45 stores and 14 departments. It's a demo, so I'm just gonna have a small bit of data. But in your case, you could have like, you know, 150 countries and, uh, you know, just name it, right? So you may have like, you know, thousands of stores and, you know, departments, and you can bring all of that here as long as you have a big size in terms of a terabyte of memory, right? And then um, this is historical data. So the data spans from, you know, uh, May, um, sorry, February, 2010 to April, 2012, uh, weekly data. And I want to build a 30 day forecast model, right? So how do I do that? Um, um, and uh, remember, we're going to, there's a lot of department and stores. So there's like a lot of uh, the weekly sales patterns are very different for all of these, but we're going to do all of this in one shot and do it. Okay. So that's the beauty of it. You don't have to go per department, per store and build a model for each one of these. And also we use, we're going to use automatic machine learning. So it's a totally industrial strength, um, you know, a machine learning software that can build forecast models. And uh, obviously supply chain, always goes with forecast models. So if that forecast model, you don't gonna have supply chain. And I'm gonna have a target column. I'm gonna pick weekly sales and I'm gonna pick a time column. I'm gonna say date and voila. And then I'm gonna say test data set because I really wanna, uh, just a holdout data set. So the model is not gonna look at this data set. It's only gonna look at the training, uh, play with it, build the models, build the features, right? Like it's looking at like exponential moving averages and it's gonna do all of it. And then finally, it's going to score on the test data set. So you can actually see actual versus compared. And obviously, uh, if it matches closely, which means you have a good model that you can trust, right? That you can actually put in production. And that's the best you can do with historical data, right? You really don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks, but the best you can do is to test it out on a holdout data set. The model is not seen, right? And the key we are doing that is that you don't want your model to memorize on your training data set. You want your model to generalize on the training data set in order to be able to score on production. So once you do all of that, we give you some default settings. We have decided a lot of things here. We say launch experiment, and then you pick your forecast horizon and you go, right? So when I launch experiment, it's gonna actually go build it um, because for the uh, because we don't have a whole lot of time, I'm actually gonna go and uh, look at a existing model here that I've trained. I've trained a couple of models and I put it all in like high settings here and then I lowered the feature engineering so it can build like some really complex feature engineering, right? So it took about four hours on this box with two GPUs. Um, you know, uh, uh, obviously it's not the greatest instance I can think of, but you can see like how many models it built and back tested and it actually takes the data set and splits them into training and valid. It takes the training data set and creates um, uh, training and validation splits, like multiple splits and cross validate and all of that and then moving windows and 
It also does like exponential moving averages and target lag features. And so you don't have to do anything. Once you're done, uh, I want you to focus on this, right? So in this model, uh, uh, on the training data set, it is very conservative. We have a MAPE, which is mean absolute percentage error, which is about 129 with a very conservative estimate. But look at the test score here. Uh, on the test score, on the data it's not seen, uh, it's giving you like less than 20% error, right? Uh, even though the training was very conservative. So that's what we do in this automatic machine learning is that we try not to overfit. Uh, uh, we would rather underfit than overfit, but the key thing is that on the data it's not seen, you wanna get the really good results. Okay, so uh, I don't want to go too much into it, but the key thing here is that uh, I built two models here. So we got two models, back tested. Uh, yeah, this model, like, let's look at this model briefly. Uh, this one is actually a much better model, you would imagine, because you can see like the training value is 52, MAPE, but the test score is 53. It's not a, uh, it's definitely higher than uh, 18, but they're comparable. So some data scientists would say, hey, I think this is more robust, right? Uh, so this is the best you can do. And I challenge you that uh, in most cases, your data scientists will not be able to build these models in like just like in a few hours across so many different time groups. And that's kind of like the power of uh, driverless AI, right? So once you build a model, so what do you do with it, right? So as soon as you build a model, uh, you can actually go and deploy it. Uh, and how do you do that? So we do have a product called MLOps that's actually built in the hybrid cloud. They're all running in Kubernetes. The driverless AI is running in Kubernetes. The MLOps is running in Kubernetes. I go here and then I see those two models, right? The DevOps, I see those two models. So as a data scientist, you can say, hey, I built a model and now I can actually share that model uh, with a DevOps engineer who knows a lot about downstream processes. And then that DevOps engineer sees this screen and he sees a couple of models here. And then uh, they can actually go and say, hey, what is this model? I wanna really see what this model is. And we have an option called download auto report uh, uh, that basically uh, allows the DevOps engineer to look at, uh, in fact, of course, the data scientists can also look at that, uh, to look at and understand what the model has, right? Uh, so I'm gonna go and click here. Um, and then, um, okay, so, um, there we go. Uh, okay, so this is not exactly a Word document per se, but you can see like a well-formatted one. So this one actually tells you about everything about the model, right? Uh, so the DevOps slash uh, data ML engineer can actually look at this and say, huh, this model overfits, so I probably want to send it back, right? So they can actually uh, reject that model. Or if it looks really good, right? So look at all the features and it looks good. And then, you know, um, um, and then um, everything looks good. Uh, they can say, hey, I want to dockerize it and deploy it in Kubernetes. Uh, so are we going to run a command to do that? Uh, not in this tool, right? So. Uh, so the, uh, the DevOps engineer can say, hey, let's do, um, deploy to products, good to go, right? And then um, I'm gonna do that. Now what's happening, the MLOps is taking a model uh, from driverless AI with all the feature engineering and model scoring, great. I'm doing a demo right now, so it failed. Um, and then basically it's gonna deploy it and dockerize it and push it in production, right? So what's happening right now is the model that I pushed today morning, it's actually running here. And then uh, if you look at the uh, sample request here, um, so basically uh, this REST servers uh, that is running, I won't go into too much details, but here is a command like a website. Uh, this is a URL, uh, that's your REST endpoint, right? Uh, that actually is serving the model. So it's kind of like a web service is serving the model right away. And then uh, the downstream applications can actually call this uh, with the data and say, hey, give me the weekly sales for this day and this store and this department on the fly and it's gonna give you an estimate with the confidence scores, right? Like a night if uh, you're gonna also get like a confident intervals and things like that. Uh, so the business can decide. So going all the way from automatic machine learning to deployment and then consumption, right? Can be a rest service. So what other ways you can consume this model, right? So uh, so let's go, let's go back to this um, app store here. Uh, I'm gonna actually show you some uh, so let me switch to another uh, Kubernetes instance here, uh, like another one. Um, so let's look at the predictive maintenance, for example, um, app here. So this app was created by a data scientist in just like a couple of days or uh, maybe a few hours, right? 
So you need to get some training on a, a tool called Wave SDK. And once you know that it's just Python, there's no JavaScript or HTML or anything like that. Um, so basically any data scientist uh, without any UI experience can create an app that I'm gonna show you right now, right? Um, so this app basically consumes one of the models that I'm, I was just showing you built by the automatic machine learning platform. Um, so this one actually runs in real time, uh, right? Obviously some of them are simulated. So this is actually based on uh, machine failure, based on different sensor readings. So there are multiple categories of engines in this data set. Uh, it's actually from NASA, the data set. Uh, and it has a lot of sensor readings. And also um, there is a column there, uh, remaining useful life, like uh, that's actually historical data. So basically uh, we run the machine learning uh, model. Uh, it's kind of like a, a survival analysis sequel under the machine learning paradigm, but we actually build the app out of it. All of these things like indicators, the real-time updates, it's done, done by a few lines of Python code. So you're not even drawing these circles or anything like that. So you basically say, hey, I want this widget. I want you to put it there. You know, you can actually put a for loop and create all of this and then uh, make a very interesting one on the manufacturing floor, right? Like I said, the make, operate, innovate. We saw the make, which is creating a model. Uh, the operate is the deployment of model. And this is the innovate. Like you take the uh, output of the, um, the model uh, or, and this is actually talking to a server deployment. I was sending sensor data and then and doing some predictions, right? The predictions are coming from the REST server that we deployed. And it's actually showing you exactly like what to do. This is very prescriptive. Right now it's saying that engine nine is gonna fail, right? And then obviously you wanna trust it and you wanna say, okay, great, you're saying, but why, right? So uh, remember like, um, so with the HTO machine learning models, you're also gonna have explainability uh, like recent codes and things like that. So when we build a model, we create like Shapley values and uh, K-line recent codes and whatnot. So basically um, uh, here for engine seven, it's actually showing you like it's gonna fail in you know, uh, 200 periods in the future, right? It's gonna be green for a while, but it's gonna to go to warning and it's gonna go into red. And then you can actually look at the Shapley values. Like for example, it's saying here, since 11, uh, you know, the maximum value is going higher. So based on historical data, it's gonna fail in the future, right? So it is predictive analytics, but here it's being a little bit prescriptive because we're actually telling you what sensors are, why we think that the you know, machine is gonna fail uh, using the recent codes. So that's the whole power of it is that you're, you're going from make, operate and innovate and then after that, it's going to be super prescriptive for you to do something about it. It's not about a model. It's about what you do with it, right? So, so you're going to get all of that on the hybrid cloud, right? These apps, um, uh, really like a few lines. I strongly encourage you to go and look at Wave SDK if you're a Python uh, programmer. And a lot of examples on like just like a few hours, you can create some great apps. I, I, oh, with or without has show. If you want to use a show model, AutoML model, you can. But if you want to use some library out there and build that, you can totally do that. And remember, when you actually buy the product, all of this is going to run behind your infrastructure, right? We're not hosting it. So you manage the cost, you decide how many parts are going to run, you decide how many data scientists are going to come on board. So basically, you can totally size this and scale it and uh, do automatic machine learning, model operations, all of that just out of the box, right? Our data scientists have also created, you know, various different image um, uh, applications and all of this. The driverless AI application that I showed you can also work on NLP and image data. So it's not just structured data, right? So we have, you know, image architecture, neural architectures and NLP and BERT models. And so you can actually bring in images, text, structured data into the same model to create a very powerful model, right? For example, if you're doing predictive maintenance, you probably want to capture images of whatever that you have that makes sense. Let's say you have a robot that's in the manufacturing plant that's actually looking at stuff and you know you have some key images that are coming out or like you know uh, if you're doing some uh, maintenance work on a duct or something, uh, you know you're an engineering company, you can totally take pictures of that, uh, incorporate the model, uh, right? If it's if you're a hospital that's actually doing you know whatever, but for supply chain, uh, you can think of, I'm sure you can think of a lot of use cases where you have images, uh, text data, as well as uh, time series, and you can put all of them and create a robust model, right? So, um, all right. Um, uh, so I think, um, so uh, we have uh, another a few minutes and I'm happy to show you a couple of more uh, demos. Uh, we've talked about COVID-19. 
Um, so let me uh, jump back here. All oh, right. Uh, so I have to say all, and then uh, so we do have a COVID nineteen um, uh, demo uh, that you can look at. Uh, so this data set basically looks at uh, oh there it is sorry uh, this one here I probably don't have the latest one on this instance but it's good so in this COVID demo uh, what we're doing is that we are getting data from uh, you know John Hopkins uh, um, a data set New York Times data right we do historical data and we constantly build models and keep it updated um you know power group models for anyone to go and do code forecast in their county just to let you know right so in your supply chain models you would actually use the code forecast right along with your other planning data in the future in order to be able to estimate things so that's going to make it more robust right and again it depends on um if, if a particular county or state is uh, vaccinated then uh, that uh, results are going to be a little bit different than all places that are not vaccinated, right? So, so the, the key thing here is that the same supply chain model that worked on two different states will not work anymore right now because the vaccination rates are different. So you have to incorporate that in order to build robust models, right? You can't have one size fits all. And that's exactly where I'm going is that you need to have COVID-19 data at a granular level, you know, and you can actually totally incorporate them in a county level forecast if you really wanted to. And that's all part of your supply chain. Uh, model uh, being more robust. Um, so we showed COVID-19, we showed um, uh, forecasting. Uh, oh yeah, we also have the demand sensing um, app built in. Um, so basically now you can take a time series model that I showed you, and then um, uh, you can actually, um, uh, what you can do is, um, and what I'm doing right now is that I'm actually superimposing the COVID data on top of an existing time series model, right? So let's say there's a big uh, uh, Corona variant uh, that's actually, you know, the last couple of weeks there has been a big increase of it, but your time series models are a month old. Now you can actually superimpose the Corona um, uh, or a climate change, just name it like anything like drastic, on top of an existing model and make adjustments to those uh, predictions. So uh, let me show you that here. Okay, so gas. Okay, so there we go. So this is actually done. Uh, it's surprisingly, you can see this. Is, the black is the actual sales, um, actual sales data, and then uh, the blue and uh, the green one is actually what we forecasted. Right? It's a little bit off, but um, you know, not the highest mape. Uh, yeah, the map is uh, pretty uh, high on the holdout set, but you can, um, sorry, uh, the forecast is all, sorry, it's blue, it's blue, right? So you can see there was a big rise in Corona here, Corona cases here. Um, and if I had not incorporated that, um, um, uh, we would have totally missed the forecast. The actual sales would have been this. And because we uh, uh, factored the Corona improvements with our forecast, we have now have an adjusted demand sensing forecast, right? So you're taking an existing model and you're superimposing some drastic change the last couple of weeks, and you're making adjustments to the AI models, right, on the fly, and that's demand sensing. Now, again, you can do this for at a SKU level, right? So you can keep like honing your forecast day after day, week after week to make you much more sharper, you know, estimates. And that's all part of the supply chain, uh, you know, estimate game anyway. So. Uh, so we have an app that's built on a time series model that's built on automatic machine learning, right? And all of that is available on the hybrid cloud. So I, I think I'm almost, I uh, got a couple of more minutes, but I think uh, I presented most of the content. So Tara, back to you. Uh, Thanks, Karthik. Um, we do have just three minutes and wanted to give everyone a chance to uh, ask any questions that you may have at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a QA uh, bucket there, a button there. And if you can put in your questions, we can, we can answer anything and certainly follow up if it's something more detailed. Are there any questions from any of the attendees today?
Karthik, I am not seeing anything live come in. Um, I did notice that that uh, we had the link dropped in that everyone who is participating today can sign up for a free trial. Um, we will also be sending those details to you via email uh, following this event. So with that, Karthik, I want to thank you very, very much for your time and sharing your expertise. And uh, we appreciate everyone being here today and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.